Okay, so as Brian mentioned, this is a talk split in two parts. So I will do the first part. Michi will then take over with the second part. And it should roughly take uh, seven and a half minutes for each part. I didn't put too much Rusio background information. I suppose everyone knows Rusio. If you don't, there's at the last slide, there's some links to the documentation uh, to our pre yeah, previous workshop uh, and some other informations. Um, but otherwise, I will just dive in right away. Just to give a slight uh, kind of nostalgic background. So we added OIDC token support already in 2019. This was done via funding from a European project called XTC. And since then, we are essentially uh, testing this functionality continuously on the DOMA testbed. So uh, all this functionality works, um, but it has uh, yeah, only a quite coarse functionality. And what I mean is coarse is that you can imagine everywhere where we use X509 proxies before, we largely replace this with FED tokens. And this is not really where we want to be, but it's uh, the state where we are at now. And now we are really in a, in a position where we have to refine these workflows. And this is an ongoing discussion with the WSG authentication workbook. So I'm very thankful for that collaboration because we are not token experts. And um, a lot of these slides uh, which come now is really a, a collaboration between different people. And um, yeah, thanks a lot for that. There's also a lot of interest from non-high energy physics communities, especially the astronomy sector, since they also need these fine-grained token workflows for data embargoes. And X509 for them as a new community is simply a, a no-go. It's a huge barrier of entry. Um, yeah, the two things we want to improve with these token workflows now is uh, for security reasons, obviously, we want to go to fine-grained tokens instead of these FED tokens and for data embargoes. Um, so also for these functional reasons, potentially for new communities, not for WSG, but for uh, potentially others. There's largely for token workflows in Rusio, authenticating the Rusio itself. So doing list replicas, list data sets, and then uh, Rusio initiated third party copy requests. Uh, Michael will talk more about this. Rusio initiated deletion to storage because we usually uh, organize and orchestrate deletion completely centrally, and then downloading and uploading data to uh, from storage. And this is where the biggest changes probably have to happen. Um, so if you look at the simple authentication workflow to Rusio, it's quite a simple workflow. The Rusio client uh, requests a token from the identity provider. Potentially, it also requests a refresh token, and I will explain this a little bit later why this might be needed. It's, it's optional. And then the Rusio client just does uh, commands to the Rusio server with this uh, authentication token. It simply needs to have Rusio audience, and that's all we ask for. For third-party copy, it's a similar workflow. Again, a uh, client requests token from identity provider goes to the Rusio server to say, I want to have a replication rule for this data to get it replicated to a certain storage. And in the background, what happens then is that there's a Rusio agent or demon who picks these transfer requests up. And at the moment, we have two workflows for that um, by submitting these two FDLs. The two workflows are either Rusio uses a, a central token um, with its own identity to submit to FDLs, Again, this will be audience limited with FDLs. Or the second workflow is to use the user's identity um, to submit to FDLs. Again, with a, probably with a token request to have also an audience limited token. And in this second use case, um, you might need to have these refresh tokens because there might be retries when uh, there's failures from FDLs or timeouts. You know, Rusio might need to retry these things. And that's why these refresh tokens might be needed. Uh, for WSG, most likely we will go for this first uh, workflow since this is also the one we are using uh, right now in this X59. Deletion requests, um, it's um, relatively similar. So the Rusio agent um, continuously iterates over files which need deletion. And right now we use one FAT token, which uh, for all the um, deletion operations, which is also not where we want to end up with. Um, this is where we need to change probably quite a bit. Um, so in the future, this will be that Rusio uh, with its own um, uh, token requests also 
Brucey Identity Token, but with a much tighter scope and audience limited to a, a specific storage. And then this Brucey agent will only go with this token to that storage element. And if you imagine a lot of different storage elements, they will have all then specific tokens, which are audience limited. Should these ever get uh, out of hand, then it's, uh, yeah, the damage is at least limited. And the biggest change, and this was more recently discussed in the authentication workgroup, is the Rusio download. And there we really want to have a very fine-grained um, uh, workflow where the tokens are limited to only being specifically allowed to um, access certain files or certain directories on only certain storage elements. And how this would look like the Rusio client, um, a user would start a download workflow, a Rusio download command. Uh, first thing, um, the user gets its own identity uh, identity token, authentication token, goes with this one to the Rusio server with the download command. Uh, the Rusio server would then um, um, request a token from IAM, which is very scope limited and audience limited to the uh, specific files this Rusio download command is uh, involved with. And it replies this then to the Rusio client and the Rusio client Hello? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Okay, let me yeah, we, we um, lost you maybe apologize. Maybe seconds just... Okay, is this visible again? Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, and these tokens are then used for the specific download uh, in protocol interactions, for example, with GFL. Um, the second workflow is that uh, not necessarily these this red token does not necessarily be need to be under Rusio identity. It could also be the user's identity, which might be um, beneficial for um, traceability. But I suppose this is something which needs to be discussed. And quickly, as some last remarks. So how these properly scoped and audience limited tokens. So the plan is to return these directly in the list replicas query. So this is the query where the different uh, possible replicas with their passes, protocols, and storage elements are returned to the Rusio client. The tokens would be uh, right away be part of this, one, uh, this query. Probably we'll also need an alternative REST endpoint for users which do not directly use the Rusio clients, but still want to interact with storage. And possibly, um, I think we need this REST endpoint for then users to get these tokens. A few things uh, I think we have to think about um, uh, um, this Rusio as the central token issuing component. Um, for one, it gives us this really unique and great opportunity to make these tokens very specifically scoped and audience restricted. And also it gives us possibly not for uh, HEP scientists, but for other scientists, the opportunity to, to limit data access. Um, like data embargoes, as I mentioned before, they might be then based on projects, on scopes, on data sets, or possibly metadata in Rusio. And you could really also tune these data access very fine grained. But there's also some risks which we need to properly assess uh, for now. Um, Rusio, I mean, is not really in charge of these um, uh, yeah, security workflows. I mean, we completely rely on other entities taking care of this. And that we have to, I think, properly assess, not only Rusio, but the entire token-driven software stack. And uh, yeah, what this means is probably some security audits as well, how we deal with tokens, how the infrastructure deals with tokens, that I just wanted to add as a remark. And but that, I'm at the end already and giving over to Michael, who will tell you about the FDS workflows. Okay, hello everybody. I hope it works now. And let's get down to it. I want to present you FTS and tokens. And perhaps this will be a bit more technical, but that's also because FTS works at a, a bit lower level than Lucio. We are more part of the infrastructure. So uh, bear with me to the technical details. I hope most of you already know FTS and that's why I will skip the advertisement. I just want to highlight that we support both X509, which was before, and uh, recently as part of the XDC project, we added support for OIDC tokens. A bit about FTS, uh, probably the most important thing about this slide is that we are in the one exabyte files per year. 
one exabyte total volume per year transport, and we work in the one billion files per year. And we support 36 VOs and around 36 is the ones that we know of. And we also support right now five token identity providers, such as the WLCG IM token provider. And since this is a presentation shared with Lucio, I recomputed for October 2021 and about 75% of our transfers, they actually come from Lucio as the issuer. Now, FTS and barrel tokens. There are two kinds of tokens supported in FTS. Uh, the user provided tokens, we will call them, these are the OIDC tokens and that's how we call them from now on. This is the user providing at submission an access token. FTS reads it, contacts the token provider and obtains a refresh token. And FTS has to ensure that at the time of transfer, it has a valid access token. And the other kind of tokens are tokens that FTS obtains. And these are what I call the storage element issued tokens. The user submits with the proxy certificate. FTS, when it starts the transfer, it contacts its storage, the source and the destination, obtains the barrel token from them. And in the ideal story, the proxy is to be forgotten at this point, never to be used and spoken about again. Okay, so the OIDC token flow. Uh, we start at one where the user submits a job with a token. FTS uses that token exchanges with the provider and gets a refresh token. At the time of the transfer, FTS makes sure that it has a valid access token. It can obtain a new access token because yeah, it has the refresh token and then starts the transfer. If it's a third party copy, this is the token that will be used to speak both with the source and the destination storage endpoint. Some technical details. Token validation can be done also offline, so we don't have to contact the token provider every time. And this is also the part where we can play with audiences and scopes. And to submit it, I've put the command. It's as simple as just passing a new field at submission, which is the access token. And this is how it looks like in practice. The user comes with an open ID connect access token, passes to FTS, FTS will get a refresh token and the refreshed access token. It passes this down to GFAL and GFAL will only use the refreshed access token when contacting the storages. And it will do third party copy, well actually HTTP third party copy. Now, the other kind of tokens, the FTS obtained tokens or what I call the storage element issue tokens. Simply put, this is exchanging an X519 proxy certificate into a barrel token. And this new barrel token is for a given path and a given set of capabilities. This functionality has been introduced. It exists in FTS for some time, about two or three years. But recently it has been extended and it's part of core GFAL2 now. It's also exported in the Python bindings and the command line interface tools. And it's the tool we want to use in, we want to make available for all of WSCG to obtain these storage element tokens. And this is available starting from GFAL version 220. To use it from the command line, I put an example. It's GFAL token, the host path, and the set of activities. And this is the workflow for this kind of tokens. The user starts with an X509 proxy certificate, speaks with FTS, submits a transfer. Eventually, FTS will start the transfer agent. This is the FTS URL copy component. This one calls GFAL2, and then it checks. If we don't have a global OIDC token, and if we are set to retrieve the storage element token, that's when we exchange the 509 proxy certificate and get a barrel token. And then we start the third party copy. And we have a distinct token from the source and a distinct token from the destination. In conclusion, we can see already that FTS accommodates two separate, let's call them token workflows. Uh, the storage element issue tokens are kind of in between. They still rely on proxy certificates, but they are a good way forward. And as well, the mechanism, the whole TPC, whether it's OIDC token or storage element token, 
this doesn't change. For HTTP, these are barrel tokens. Uh, one, what we can see already for OIDC tokens, we use the same token for both the source and the destination. And this is something that we have to see how the token, the token evolution in WLCG, whether this will be good enough or we'll have to change it. And what we're waiting on, and Martin actually mentioned the WLCG authorization working group, we want to refine how FTS uses scopes and audiences. For the moment, we're waiting on this to, we're waiting on a decision and how to refine them. That'll be it. So thank you for listening. And if you have any questions.